What's up, Accelerators? Welcome to Normalize It, the show where we speak about and explore the business of disability inclusion and accessibility. I'm your host, Cam Baudouin, and on each episode, I'll be interviewing leaders, professionals, and people with lived experiences. And we'll be discussing the challenges, successes, and strategies on how to make this world a more inclusive place. As you know, many organizations are still trying to figure out disability inclusion through a trial and error method. That's inefficient. Stick around to the end of the show to find out how we can fix that. So whether you're an advocate, entrepreneur, business owner, stakeholder, VP, or just someone who's interested in the world of disability inclusion, this show is for you. Let's dive into it. The one thing that you talk a lot about through your social posts is accountability around accessibility. So we really want to get into that a little bit more in the show today. But really, what keeps you motivated to drive the change and to continue the conversation on disability inclusion, either in your social posts or just kind of just what we're uh, talking about today? I'm born with my disability. can't register blind, as you said. If you want to get medical, it's up to albinism and the stigmas. But as I tell everybody, my eyes go for little uncontrolled walks or little dances. And as well as that, I have the same condition as an albino, only I have pigmentation. So I've lived that my whole life and I didn't necessarily get the support I needed or when I began trying to find work, I didn't really get any support and I struggled to gain and retain employment. And because of that, I stayed silent for so long. Um, and like in the past, I think four years, is when I really found my voice and I know some people find this really cringy but I must say I found I felt really empowered and for the first time in my life I started talking about my lived experience I started standing up and saying I have a disability stop counting me out or well actually no you said no you won't give me this adjustment or you won't make this accessible but by law you need to so I kind of started to self-advocate because I've been silent for so long I blamed myself and I let myself think I was the burden rather than realize society was disabled in me. So once I kind of start speaking, I haven't shut up. <laughs> and I'm still going, I ramble quite a lot. <laughs> See, you know what? You're bringing up something that I know a lot of people in the audience or a lot of people listening really, you know, kind of resonate with is that at some point you kind of just say enough is enough. And I think we as advocates kind of feel that tug. We feel that pull after a while to say, you know what, I, I'm not really happy with the way people are treating me or people aren't listening to me or things like that. How? So uh, do, you have, do you have like a specific scenario? Was, did something kind of come up that really just made you put your foot down to uh, to speak up for yourself? Yeah, like I, um, I, do you know if you looked at my CV, you would say I was a job hopper. And we all know that typically companies look at CVs with people job hop and think, oh, I'm not hiring them. When you add disability into the mix, it's like, oh, no, go away. We do not want you. So, and I, I, I had faced that for so long. Like I had more jobs and hot dinners. I was going from contact center to contact center because it's easy to get a job in kind of entry level role than it is obviously to, I can't go for senior roles because I didn't have the experience. I wasn't staying in places longer than a couple of months. So I was jumping job to job. I was either getting sacked or I was walking out. I had some really spectacular dramatic moments where I took headsets off and flung them down and stormed out of the building. And it was, I lived my best angry life and walked out, but it was frustration and I would go home and I would cry. I would walk out of a job and cry because I thought I was the problem. And so my mental health kept taking a hit each time. And each time I lost a job or got rejected for a job. And you know when you're being rejected because you're disabled. When somebody said it to me at an interview, oh, do you drive? And I'd say no. Like, I don't need to see your facial reaction to know when there's a change in the way your tone of voice it just drops. And then the interview finishes in less than five minutes. It's, you know what's happening. So it chisel, it just chisels away at you, so it does. And it broke me down. And I had worked for the longest period I had in my life, which was just over two years. And I was like, yes, this is great. I feel really empowered. But I was putting up and I was settling because I was comfortable and I felt safe when I had a job. And this is all I needed. But I was dealing with ableism by colleagues. I'd been discriminated. I wasn't getting the adjustments I needed. And I, I, would still, I was still going home and crying at night. And that didn't feel like belonging or job satisfaction to me. So I ended up leaving that role. And at that time, I was back to square one. And I happened to stumble across a friend's Facebook post that says, oh, I work in recruitment and we're hiring. And I kind of thought, imagine if I was behind that table rather than the other side of it. And somehow I got the job. And in the past just over, well, three and a half years, I've been working for AMS, which is a global recruitment RPO, which 
sassy me through GI source recruitment, but they give me the opportunity to use my lived experience and I found my voice and over the past few years I think I've just and my family say to me, it's like you're just this different person, you know, you you've went from being in this dark, lost, or as I say, blindly wandering through life to I, I have direction and I just want to keep telling people that your lived experience can make a difference because it's done for me. And that's what drives me every day is I don't want anybody else to be in that situation or feel that way. And we will continue to, it will continue to happen, but one small change with accessibility or one small mindset shift can have such a big impact in so many. Yeah, you, you know, I, I love what you said that really those little small changes, like if you start to think that, hey, this this can be done and I can actually speak out and not be, you know, slapped down, or I can I can actually speak out and not be turned away or turned like uh, turned down from a job or a or a social post or even just a conversation. I know simple conversations that if you just said, you know, hey, can we can, can we just slow down? Um, I you know I I'm not following fast enough. Like I, I'm not able to concentrate on this, and that is empowering. Once you realize that people around you say. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Or if you, or if you're able to have that conversation, and then, and then people around you create that safe space for you as well. You mentioned that word belonging, which is just so valuable and so important now uh, in in the world of of careers and employment. And uh, I mean, I love what you just said there. But hold on, before we go any further, I want to ask you what, where did you come up with a, a blind ADHD rhino? Like, where, how did that come up? <laughs> so, like, I um, I'm stubborn, um, and everyone's always told me I'm stubborn. My mom used to say, "You're stubborn as a rhino." But I had got this notebook years ago. I think I mean years ago. It must have been when I was, I'm not going to give my age away, but it must have been 12 plus years ago. And a friend had given me this book and I said, Ryan, it's a chubby unicorns. And I kind of loved it and didn't think nothing of it. But I kept, I kind of, I kept thinking about it over the years. It's like, uh, people used to say to me, because I was gay, where's your unicorn? And it was like almost like this mocking joke. And I, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a skinny boy. Like I'm a chubby, I'm a bit chubby like a Ryan. And this book kept out of my head. And over the past few years, people were telling me, you shouldn't say you're disabled. You shouldn't say, you should say you're a person with, dis- a, person with a disability. And I was getting told off. And I was like, I'm getting told off my identity. And I, I was online and I seen this Rhinos of Trouble Unicorns again. And I just went, do you know what? That saying has followed me around. All these little things add in. I don't want to conform to what other people telling me I should be or how I should identify. So do you know what? I'm a registered blind rhino and I can't be stubborn. And I, it just kind of took off as my brand. And yeah. I have jumpers with it on it. My family think I'm bonkers. But it's, I think it's just nice to get away from that conversation of, oh, you shouldn't say that. You should say I'm disabled. It's, it just steers, steers straight away from it. Yeah, because you, you talked about the word identity, and it's not like no one else is allowed to tell us what our identity is a- in any way, shape, or form. You know, you mentioned about uh, you you kept hearing this where someone says, uh, you know, you don't have a disability, that you're a person with a disability. And I'm big on language, and I think that if I'm speaking about somebody else, I have to watch my words, I have to watch my language, and I have to think about that. But if I'm speaking about myself, I'm allowed to call myself, yeah. I'm colorblind. Like there's no, there's no uh, other way around that. I just, I just admit it to myself just like that. So uh, you can call yourself whatever you want. And this is for anyone else listening too. don't let anyone else try to define your identity for you either. That's no one else's place to do that. And now you're out there on LinkedIn and I see you, especially on LinkedIn. Is that your only big social network? You got to tell me where we can find you because we're going to get into that pretty deep. I'm going to be honest, LinkedIn, I, I'm on Twitter at the moment, but I'm, an, I'm one of those users at the moment who's sitting back, devastated what happened to Twitter in, at the end of 2022 there. And I'm just there at the moment because I have another podcast to announce next week, and then I'll probably be out of there. But I'm trying to get big into TikTok, but LinkedIn, find me on LinkedIn, honestly. I spend more time on LinkedIn. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, can't sleep, ADHD, sitting in hyper-focus when I post on LinkedIn, going through and reading articles. Like it's, it's a great addiction, but it does it's definitely a lot of more time consumed than it should be. <laughs> <laughs> and as but I see a lot of the same theme come up in your posts, right? You've got um, caricatures or you've got drawings of people and talking about accessibility, uh, tips, tricks, hints. And then you've got the other side where you're talking about, you know, lived experiences and those do really well as well. Uh, you want to talk to me about both of those uh, and for the audience as well? Like, I'll be honest, like I came on to LinkedIn when I started working for AMS thinking I was here to find people for jobs. I had a recruiter license. It was my first recruitment role. And I was fo- following people who were leading kind of, had loads of followers and were leading the way in recruitment. And we're getting all these great reviews and comments. So I was like, 
right, I'm going to copy what these people are doing. And so I started learning how to source candidates and it was really handy as well for myself. I kind of learned all these neat tricks that I never knew you could do online. Like I didn't know that you could go onto a platform and search for somebody by name, by where they're from, their location, their skills. Like it's just, it's kind of just mind boggling what you can do when you learn what sourcing is. And it blew my mind, but I kept coming across people talking about their own lived experiences. And you know, for somebody who had been silent for 28 years of his life, who had gone through that whole shame of, I don't want to be disabled and thinking I was less than, I just went, do you know what? I'm going to start putting myself out there because all this great stuff was happening at work. You know, there was a few challenges along the way at work where they didn't know what adjustments to get me, but rather than kind of brushing them to the carpet or moving me around, they worked with me to make it right for me and we got the right adjustments. So for the first time in my life, I was empowered and I started posting about it because I think the first post was very much like just taking some of the experience of my sight loss and people started kind of building a community around it, like sharing their own views, sharing their own lived experiences and it kind of took off from there and I think really in the last year, I, I don't know what happened, it was like somebody turned on a switch in me and it was like, do you know what, I'm going to start putting time in this, I'm going to start talking about my lived experiences, I'm going to start to challenge some of this inaccessibility because I love being on LinkedIn, but there's barrier after barrier. Like I get halfway through somebody's content and can't read because the rest of it's all emojis replacing things or hashtags are accessible or car sales are so badly done. They're so inaccessible. Like it just, it, it kind of just sparked me to go. Like there's so much inaccessibility and I was just like, somebody, somebody needs to challenge this out and start to call it out. And I know there was people doing it and I started following. I actually think I followed you, so I did. And then I followed Meryl and then it kind of just, I don't want to say skyrocketed because people started to engage and respond to my graphics. They started responding to what I had to say. And all of a sudden, I've been asked to speak in conferences or you know, getting paid speaking gigs. And it just kind of, I just before I knew it, I was kind of going self employed. Like it just kind of all just ran. And it all just started from this person who started feeling empowered himself by writing that lived experience because I didn't go through counseling and I didn't kind of go through any kind of way to digest all of that trauma from my past. And for me, I think that's what my content does. It kind of helps take some of that trauma, some of that ADHD thinking, because my mind is doing a hundred things at once. So it's, it takes a lot of time sometimes to make the content, but I think it's really therapeutic. And I just love the community that I've that we have around us every day. I learn something new. Somebody challenges me in something or makes me think about something in a new way. And I think for us within this space, there's no happy ending. There's no, like, your finish point will continuously have been improving on how accessible and how inclusive we are. So for me, I just think it's it's just took off. <laughs> and I'm still like kind of <laughs> Yeah, I I love what you just said there, right? Doesn't the community help you think in a different way? Or in a in a better way, right? I mean, how else um are are we or other people going to learn about everyone else who has a lived experience unless we're willing to share it? Right. And I think that's one of the biggest, you know, I know a lot of people with lived experiences with disabilities who have been put down their whole life or who live in a marginalized area or who live in uh, even a marginalized family group, something like that, or went to school and felt marginalized or, or put down. And they were ashamed. They were ashamed of their disability and said, I'm not going to share because I'm less than. And then all of a sudden we get to we get older and we bring that with us into our you know, workplace or into our life. And all of a sudden, I've heard this from many people, you know, once you start to share, you release that burden and you start to get over that, uh, that hurt and you start to uh, get over that, I'll call it pain. You get over those, those burdens. And I like how you said that therapeutic, right? Cause it can start to lift what, what weight was on your shoulders because people are helping you feel validated and helping you feel like you belong in this world and in this uh, community as well. And it's that lived experience because I think for me, like I, I have family members who have the same condition as me, but their lived experience is completely different. They're used to different adjustments, used to things done a different way. And I couldn't speak to them really about it because it was, you know, I'm from Northern Ireland. It's a very much of a, you know, we talk about marginalized communities. Like I was a Catholic gay man growing up in Northern Ireland in a really rural area. So it was very much like marginalized, marginalized, marginalized. When I put dis disabled on top of that there, you know, it was just constant pity and you just grew up with complete ableism around you and, you know, men don't cry and men don't talk about their feelings. So I grew up in that kind of community and my family were amazing, don't get me wrong, but, you know, men have this perception that we couldn't talk or we can't share things. So I didn't speak to my uncles about it and 
I grew up to smoke blood. And even when I spoke to my mom about it, she would try to give me, you know, like those crap tops. Your mom's always going to be on your side. Like, you could go out and slap somebody and come home and your mom would take your side. You know what I mean? You, I'm a mommy's boy, but just, like, I'll never go slap somebody by the way. I do not be violent. But, you know, it's my mom would defend me to the backbone. But they'll tell you what you need to hear rather than the understanding. And I think when people will live with fears reaching out to me, I never had that. And it was like, oh my God, I'm not alone. Somebody else has experienced this too. What can we learn? What can we put right from this? And that's what I started taking from my content as well. I've brought it into my work. And you know, now in work, we empower colleagues to share their lived experiences. We make videos, we do training from it. And that lived experience, we say there's no better experience than lived experience. That's how you need a table. That's how you need a conversation. And platforms like LinkedIn, there's so many more people coming out. And I'm just like, yes, we're just growing and growing. Here we are. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's in the professional world as well, where we spend so much of our time, right? If you go to, you go to work, you're working 40 hours. And if you have to be less than, or you have to hide from other people in this, such a big chunk of your, your life, how small does that make you feel? Not right. So I love it. I love it. And that's where LinkedIn can, I, I think, really shine. But you're also part of that LinkedIn accelerator program, aren't you? Uh, that just opened up in the UK, September, October, something like that. And you were picked. You were one of the chosen. I was one of the chosen. So it was uh, a six weeks program. So and, and I wanted to say, it was, it was the first UK accelerator program. There was yeah. six weeks of mentoring, training, kind of upscaling you in different social media content and realizing that well, I'm going to be honest, I applied for it. I didn't think I was a content creator. I just thought I was this blind man rambling online. And then the, one of the things I said in the first week was, everybody who posts on LinkedIn or posts something online, you're a content creator. Whether there's a job, whether, whether there's a research or an article, you're a content creator. And they kind of taught us different skills. Like I now know how to set up my lighting. So um, I will, I'm kind of blinded by it, but I know there should be a lighting for me, one at the side, one at the other side. You know, I, I've learned all these kind of different tricks. and. I think the thing that really got me was that when I applied, I talked about accessibility, about wanting to help them make a change on LinkedIn. And they kind of said, they kind of asked you, what are you going to do if we invest in you? Because there's kind of, there was a bursary with it as well, a cash kind of incentive. And it was like, what are you going to invest this in? And I was like, I don't know, maybe starting a business because I do this on the side of my desk. I'm already working like double what a full-time job is. I was doing 40 hours at work and then doing an additional 50 hours of like in the evenings because ADHD don't sleep. Um, and I was, it kind of, I felt like they kind of was taking a chance on me when they said yes, because it was kind of them showing to me that they had a commitment to be accessible, even though we know there's a lot, a lot of change that needs to be done like that. But you know, I think that the fact that they are starting to recognize people with flipped experience and bringing them to the conversation, and it actually led to me speaking with them um, during some of the disability awareness training that they've done. They've brought me on as a paired speaker and things like that. So for me, it's, it shows a commitment. And I thought, to be honest, I applied for that there at like one o'clock in the morning and on a whim thinking, do you know what? If I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. I'll just continue doing what I was doing. And I don't think I did anything really different to what I do. I just kind of made a lot of car sales because you had a certain criteria to hit. <laughs> But you made it, right? You made it. And now isn't it all better. And actually, I think it's really funny. You know, you mentioned something earlier on about carousels. And I mean, anyone who works in the accessibility industry knows that carousels, they suck, right? We all know that they suck, right? <laughs> we all know. And it was this brand new thing that LinkedIn brought in. Oh, you know, here it is. We're going to make it all really well and good. I think I can count on one hand the number of carousels that I purposely swipe and you know the basics of carousels being you should be showing the buttons to indicate that there are images to the right and to the left they don't exist unless you hover over it so i mean there's all these things with that as well i just thought i'd throw that in there to like you know remind everyone uh, you know carousels are kind of yeah i mean we, we they suck i've been coming on people like since like to start monday i think was my first post i think i've done about three different posts this week about them alone and they're just, we've started this trend. It's like something shining in you and everyone's starting this trend. And it's like, we've started a trend already in the first week, which is inaccessible car sales. And I've tried to be really polite on the people's posts and be like, accountability for accessibility or do, you know, cause most of them's like top 10 tips or how to do this in three different ways. And I'm always like adding that extra number or extra bullet point saying, make it accessible. And people's agreeing with me. And I'm like, <laughs> you're agreeing with me. Yes, Why? yes, you know, yes. And so that education. And that's why I do it is, what people one person knows you teach another person and it impacts one person and it's just escalates 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Like the only way we can make that positive change is through like incremental changes. All changes like that, by the way, it doesn't all have to be this big splash, but um, okay. Uh, you want you, I think the first post that I ever remember interacting with you with our camel case and you put a lot, you talk about alt text. Uh, let, let's talk about your top three. Cause I see a lot that, that you're reminding people a lot. So uh, uh, talk to us about that. How can we learn from that? What do we, what should we be reminding people? Camel kiss um, or possible kiss. I prefer camel kiss because I love a camel. It's actually one behind me, I think you can see it. Um, so I am um, obsessed with camels always helping. And one of the things I noticed when I was first on LinkedIn was just people who use a lot of hashtags, but when I was looking at it, I could never really tell what it was. And I was making a lot of stupid guesses. And I would say it to my partner or to my colleagues, and they would kind of look at me and say, that's not what that says. I was like, right, I was trying to screen read it on all week good. My screen reader was having problems with it. And at the time it was a really basic screen reader. So of course it was having problems with it, but it was having problems. So I didn't know what was going on. So the more I kind of learned into it and started researching, I found out that some of it was either called camel kiss or Pasco kiss. And that is where you capitalize each new word in your hashtag. And essentially it's not just good for everybody. It's, it's it makes it more accessible. It makes it accessible for screen readers. It makes it accessible for people who are neurodivergent, people with cognitive disabilities, people like me who are visually impaired or registered blind. Do have some sight, but it's not that great. And just that one little change makes it so much easier to read. And you know, we talk about accessibility benefiting everybody, and I know some people is really against that. But for me, I think about accessibility. And I think everybody, everything should be designed with universal design, making it accessible from the get go. And these hashtags really support everybody because anybody can mistake your hashtag for anything. You know, if you have puppy slaughter, so puppy slaughter, the R and S at the end of puppy, so it's puppies slaughter. That sounds like puppy slaughter, but when you capitalize the P and the L, that's puppies laughter. Yes, so it yes. That it shows how bad and misleading that could be. But also, if you want to really know more about camel case or the benefits of making accessible hashtags, Google Susan Boyle. A hashtag. Yes. This Reba comes up. Season twelve had an album party. It was not an album party, apparently, and they had a PR boobery. So you know, it's just easier for everybody. It's accessible and benefits you. The only unfortunate thing is that a lot of social media networks they default to the non camel case, so you do have to be very intentional about it. But it makes it easier to read for everybody. So pro tip. Let's move on though. You also talk a lot about alt text. You you talk that about that a lot. I uh, want you hit me with some alt text. Yeah, so um, the easiest way for me to explain alt text is essentially it, your know, screen reader is a piece of technology that supports somebody who has, is disabled. It can be any disability, anybody can use it. A screen reader will help that person create a mental image of your picture or your graphic, whatever it is you posted. So it helps them create that mental image. Now, it's a short description, it's factual, it's straight to the point. There's usually a character limit on LinkedIn is 300. So you can only use 300 characters to write this alt text, but you don't need to go into massive detail. So, you know, if you're posting, say a flyer, you don't need to put down that there's balloons in the left corner and balloons in the bottom corner and the sparkles here, and the sparkles are all text. So one thing I will say alt text is any text in your graphic, it needs to be an alt text. It supersedes everything else. If there is no room at all for this here, what you want to do is think about the message. What is the message that you're trying to get across with this? Now, I do want to say as well, alt text is different to image description because there's people who will say you only need one or the other. But Meryl Evans said in her TED talk um, that you know when you communicate with somebody, there's three ways that you want to, want to communicate with somebody or should always try to communicate with somebody. I think the same with alt text with images. So you have your, your actual image, visual, you have your alt text, which is typically embedded and you will not see it unless you're using a screen reader. What happens if you can't use a screen reader? What happens if you or don't feel comfort comfortable using one? Because I'll tell you now, they are hard to use. When I was first on my iPhone, I ran 999 for emergency services, not because I intentionally did it, but because I was trying to learn how to use my new screen reader. So they can be difficult. So thirdly, image description is a message that is added to the message body or a pinned comment, or if you're doing it on a website, into the caption. That's three ways a person can access that image. So that's the way I think about it. And the difference between alt text and image description is, alt text is short and to the point, a bit like tweet, and then your image description is a wee bit longer, like LinkedIn message, and you go into a little bit more detail. So alt text will say, there's a puddle on the floor. The image description will say, there's a puddle on the floor, but the puddle's in the middle of the floor, and it's actually red wine from last night. 
So we'll go into a little bit more detail. So always opt for both, not one or the other. Yeah, I love that. I really love that. And you know, you said something that not a lot of people talk about, which is sometimes screeners can be hard. And one thing that I found was through speaking and being in this or this uh, industry for a while is that there are some people who come directly from a screen, like, like they just became uh, visually impaired, right? They all, all of a sudden, it, like it happened very suddenly. And they're still learning the tech. And there's other people who have been using a screen reader from birth, right? Like or pretty much as soon as they could use technology. And those are, you know, two very different people. And then there's people who are adapting to technology when they're older and some when they're younger. Maybe they're more apt in technology, maybe not. They don't want to. So this is all kind of like uh, experiences and, and, and tips from people who actually use it real uh, real time. I'm not, a, I'm not a daily user of a screen reader. I know how to use it because it was part of my job. But uh, even all the tips that I read online, what we really need to do is hear more things like that, which is which is what I love. And actually, here's a, here's a fun tip. What I found is that speaking to people uh, who are older, they prefer to hear longer alt text compared to people maybe from the uh, the, the uh, younger generations, uh, Gen Z, Gen Y. <laughs> you know, we want to hear things short to the point. And so, depending again on who your audience is, you may want to adjust that alt text as well. So, just a little tip there. Um, one thing that we didn't, you know, we didn't really talk about is I wanted to get really onto that accountability part, keeping organizations accountable for accessibility, because it's more than just alt text and it's more than just camel case and things like that. In your opinion, and how have you done it before? How do we keep organizations accountable for accessibility? I think everybody in that organization needs to take accountability. I think organizing the quickest way for me what I recognized how we could help organizations take accountability for accessibility was through our employee resource groups. So we have a disability group and we have a neurodiversity group and that's colleagues from right around the globe of our 10,000 plus colleagues all coming together to kind of talk about in their regions, you know, what, what's not working, what is working, what can we do to improve, you know, what partnerships can we create? And, you know, we're now an award winning ERG and I feel really like smoke saying that, but we only we got the award last month, so it's still quite new. <laughs> so we are award winning ERG and we get awarded because of the work that we were doing and we were holding our business accountable. So we were setting goals each year to work with our TA departments, to work with our other departments to on a disability confidence journey. So looking at each area of the business and how that was impacted and where we could improve. And over time, that led to me actually being promoted into my disability inclusion coordinator role, which is a role that was paved out specifically for me to help drive disability inclusion at AMS. So I am now held to account for accessibility and you know it's not it's not easy because when you're an organization and you have been going for a number of years you've already quite a lot of an accessibility deep rooted in your culture you've already got maybe internet spaces or web pages designed which you've paid loads of money for but they're not accessible so it's a journey but it's about taking that journey together being really honest and you know, make, making small milestone moments because you know you're not going to make this overnight Companies can't, you know, not every company is going to throw money at this and say, yep, yeah, that's fixes that we're done. Not every company is in a position to do that. So it's setting small milestones, setting up those employee resource groups, and getting somebody in to those roles in disability inclusion or those DEI focused roles. And, you know, that is a department within your organization that should be holding your whole organization to account. For me, it's about more than just awareness, go beyond awareness. Awareness sessions is great. Get head speakers in to do your talks. You know, there's loads of people in the level of experience. Come on, maybe come do your talk, hi, yeah. Um, but you know, there's loads of people out there who will come and talk to you about their life experience. And I think that's all well and good. We also then need to make changes internally. There's people out there who can support you if you don't know where you're going. There's the likes of disability in if you're in the US. There's the likes of BDF, which is Business Disability Forum in the UK. There's support out there and there's allies and advocates and there's people doing extraordinary things within this space so you could be reaching out to. So go beyond awareness, continue to spread the awareness, but make take action and make little small goals because you'll feel like you're succeeding. And you know, I think that it will take time because you can't change the culture overnight. Yeah, and that's something that we all have to keep in our minds pretty much at all time. I, I know we want to go out there and make the entire organization change within a month. This should be done already, right? Like that's our attitude and, and that's people who are listening. I know that's our feeling and our attitude. I, we don't get budget. We don't get uh, enough funding. We don't get, uh, no one wants to listen to me. Uh, 
and I would challenge as well. And I'd say like, well, where are we putting our efforts? Are you really sitting there putting all your efforts at that bottom tier? Like if you think of every organization like a pyramid, if we're putting all of our efforts at that bottom tier, well, they don't make decisions. They, they're not the ones who are going to actually, they're listening to their boss. They're not listening to you. So ERG groups have the ability through larger groups of people to influence people at the top, leadership teams, VPs, things like that, people like that talking to them and saying, we're on this journey together. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help our whole team get better at this together. And it's not a, you do it and you give me money and then I'll fix it later. You know, it's, it's we're, we, we got to all work on this together. Uh, Jamie, thanks so much for being on the show today. Everyone, thank you so much for attending today. Thanks so much for joining. Wasn't that a great episode? You probably have lots of new ideas swirling through your head right now. Now, how are you going to go and teach that to your boss, your team, or your clients? You need a strategy to move forward. Contact me today, hi at cambodwine.com, and let's talk about how we can move this forward in your organization or individual practice. If you could right now, like and subscribe to this show, it really does help grow our reach to get more people involved and interested in disability inclusion and making the world a more inclusive place. And don't forget, you can also watch this show live on LinkedIn. Just find me there. It's every Friday at noon Eastern. See you next week.